Folks, good afternoon. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today uh, for this critical conversation. Uh, this is sort of a circling back on a previous conversation about sort of the future of the college and our facilities. As you well know, we've invested uh, some of our money that's been set aside for the strategic plan to really invest in a master plan uh, and that we have partners that have been working very closely with us over the past several months and will be working with us uh, into the remainder of this semester, this spring semester and possibly into June. Uh, a couple of things I, I, I wanna say is uh, besides thank you for your time today, but many people have been parts of conversations either in, in meetings that existed with some of the leadership staff or some of the faculty who have been able to give some input through this process. Um, we really wanna thank you for your time and energy around this. Today is really an opportunity for everyone to sort of weigh in. A couple of things I will tell you is that uh, the information uh, that we receive from Sasaki is so incredibly complete uh, that it has been condensed to some degree for you today, uh, but we will still be spending a good hour of our time hearing about the results of their conversations, data, et cetera. So uh, it will be slightly different in format today in that a good half of our critical conversation will be uh, listening to information, receiving information based on where they are thus far in the process. And the second half will be opportunity for you to make comments, ask questions, uh, that will be really important. So uh, we just ask your patience. We're also gonna be able to uh, get slides delivered to you so you can get a chance to digest this. And for those folks who could not attend today, uh, we wanna make sure that they have access to that information as well. This process is not over. I wanna emphasize that this has been an ongoing process with several parts of a timeline, so it's not over. And the other thing I'd like to uh, make sure that you all know uh, in this effort to be transparent about this process is we have not done this process in 15 years. Uh, so it feels a little overwhelming at certain times, but I wanna thank Sasaki and the Department of Capital Asset Management and uh, the fact that we are doing this process in partnership uh, has been tremendously helpful. On top of that, I want you to know that all of what we are receiving are from consultants and consultants are incredibly invaluable to any process that we talk about what happens to the college and either campus going forward, but there will be no decisions made by the Department of Capital Asset Management in Sasaki. This is information for us to digest and to use as we make decisions together going forward. So we'll get to a point where there'll be some additional recommendations, et cetera. But at this point, I want you to know that we're very grateful to have the partnership that we've had thus far with all of those. And I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Cook to introduce our guests and then begin our presentation. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, unfortunately, I've got a double audio going here. So apologies in the background. I'm trying to- Why don't you try and fix that? And I just want to recognize uh, Chairman, Chairman Campbell, who's here from our board of trustees, and Dari, who's here as our student trustee. Uh, the participation of our trustees in this process is also incredibly helpful. And uh, this is the first time that they will be seeing some of this information uh, as well as we begin to digest this as a community. Okay, to solve your audio issues. There you go. Well, I'm clo close enough to say I am. So uh, thank you all. And uh, thank you for all of you who have been helping us along in this process for several months now. Um, we are making extremely good progress on it, but we still do have months to go. And there are a, se a set of other meetings that will be occurring that um, many of you are vital to, especially wanna thank the faculty subgroup that's been helping us with this because you've got the best insights in terms of the classroom experiences on what Sasaki and our partners have been looking to uh, hear about what kind of a version of classroom learning we want for 2023 and moving forward. Um, I'm gonna tell you that um, we have a weekly, every single Monday, the group that you're about to hear from and I, we check in um, with updates as far as where things stand and they've made remarkable progress. Um, one of the principals who's been on this from day one with us, um, Tyler Patrick could not be here for us at this particular moment, but Marianne Ocampo from Sasaki is gonna step in and I know she'll do an admirable job um, representing Tyler and folks, but I also wanna introduce some of the other folks who are on this call so you can see. Um, we've been uh, very blessed. Uh, DCAM from day one of this project has assigned Ellen Whitmore, who is on, um, on the screen here with us. 
And mm -hmm. she's been helping to make sure that we're um, staying tight with our deadlines and keeping um, the state agencies plugged in. And we also have Sudesh Sen from Sasaki who is here. And I'm sorry because I'm on the off screen, but I know we have Willa uh, Q from, um, she's the director of planning with Affiliate Engineers Incorporated is on this call. And Marianne, I'm sorry, I know somebody else um, went off my screen here, but- Right, from, Tamar Warburg. From, from Tamar, from, Tamar Warburg. There you go, perfect. I'm sorry, the screen is moving around on me here. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we'd really like to turn it over to them. They're going to be doing a presentation to show what they uh, gleaned from their site visits, from their analysis, and from their conversations with folks on campus um, for the first part of this critical conversation. But then we really need to hear from uh, you folks with some of your thoughts and suggestions. Um, and I know Beth has talked about it. We're going to be continually reposting it. The chat will be disabled while the presentation is up on the screen, but once it's reopened, we have the MCC master plan at middlesex.mass.edu, and we really would implore you to use that email as much as possible for your thoughts and, and suggestions uh, moving forward here. The, you know, the, the, what we're planning is to have uh, a pretty good version of this ready um, by the end of the semester heading into the summer so that we've got a very good roadmap uh, moving forward. But I think what you're gonna see based on the conversations I've had with faculty who've been involved, um, that what Sasaki and folks have found with their analysis of our space utilization is not gonna come as a surprise to many of you in terms of um, what, we, what we're watching post COVID. So um, they, they are intentionally looking at every one of our buildings to see what kind of utilization is happening in each of those spots. Um, and they've already come, back, come up with some recommendations that I think we're gonna be hearing about um, today and moving forward. But like, like uh, the president said, please understand, we are not done with this. This has still got months to go uh, for development and what you have to share for your thoughts um, electronically or audibly here uh, with the group is, is very much valued. So uh, don't be shy about weighing in on, on what you see or what you think um, could, our next steps could be. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Marianne, I'm not sure who's doing the slide presentation for you folks, but. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Um, Sudeshna will be sharing um, the screen. Hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be with you all today. We're very happy um, to be sharing a snapshot of our campus planning process for Middlesex Community College. And I think that Ultimately, we want to hear from you all um, in regards to um, some of the analysis that we're going to be presenting today. There is, I will say, a space analysis that's being done in regards to understanding what those interior kind of um, spaces are like on both the Bedford and, and Lowell campuses. Um, but today, we're really focusing on the kind of larger um, organizational thinking for the physical analysis of both campuses. And so we are in a process where this analysis is really good for us to absorb as we hear feedback and we understand what the needs are. We'll eventually get to ways that we're thinking conceptually about design recommendations. And then we'll have a preferred plan that we develop um, as we think about decarbonization and sustainability as that's part of the way that we understand um, the kind of academic enterprise of Middlesex Community College. So that will be covered with Tamar kind of speaking to some of those goals as part of this presentation. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll say that first and foremost, the foundation of the plan is focused on understanding historically where you've been. Uh, for MCC, we understand um, as a humble beginning of you know, starting in the 1970s and 1970 um, with the Bedford Veterans Administrative kind of administration hospital site and how we began to, to kind of evolve throughout the decades. So here is just pretty much a timeline that shows you um, the kind of beginnings and the origin of Middlesex Community College and how it's evolved over time. Um, so from beginning with the Bedford VA hospital to understanding courses were offered on the Bedford campus, Arlington and Woburn kind of um, high schools and Air Force Base in the 1970s um, to really seeing in 1978 um, that the state purchased the, um, uh, this amazing site where we know the permanent Bedford campus to be today. 
by the 1980s, we saw that there were other campuses that were coming online, but the most notable one that we can speak to for today is that the Lowell campus opened at a temporary location in 1987, thereabouts. Uh, but it's really, you know, part of the foundation was established in 1988, and the permanent Lowell campus opened really in the early 90s. And throughout this time, we've seen um, that the permanent Bedford campus opened in the 90s as well um, as it evolved and that there's been all these different types of um, acquisitions that have taken place with particular facilities like the federal building opening in 2004 on the Lowell campus as part of the Lowell campus um, to ways that we're thinking about um, some of the kind of environmental systems um, with the MCC fitness trail um, that would be part of that campus experience um, to thinking about the academic arts center that was opened on the Lowell campus in 2018. Um, we know in the last three years, it's been quite a change in, in education as we think about how the college has transitioned um, with online formats and ways that we're working with hybrid in-person and online education due to the global pandemic. Um, and so we're all aware that that teaching and learning may have changed um, to some degree and how do we leverage the kind of new technologies and ways that we're, we're thinking a little differently about that. Um, but also notable here is that Middlesex Community College launched a strategic plan in 2022 to implement initiatives and plans um, through really an equity lens. So we want to make sure that this physical manifestation of that strategic plan comes to life in this planning effort. Um, so with that said, as we go to the next slide, I think that we are understanding um, Middlesex Community College as dual institutions. You have a campus in the city of Lowell, and then you have a campus in the woods, um, which is a completely different character in the way that we think about the kind of academic units that are um, located in each campus, but understanding that the physical campuses uh, between these two are very different. So we wanna be able to, to really leverage um, the environments that they're situated in and understand what the future of both campuses uh, will be um, in the next 10, 15 years and beyond. So for us on the next slide, I think it goes back to the way that we understand um, the mission and strategic objectives of Middlesex Community College, which really aims to focus on equity, to transform lives and to shape futures. As we think about equity and inclusion from a mission perspective, we understand it's through ways that we think about education, understanding how to support all different types of students, and that there's cultural, economic, and workforce, workforce needs of the local and global communities um, that make up MCC. The strategic directions um, that we're aware of from this planning effort is also about the culture of equity mindedness and expansive excellence. What does that mean as we think about space, as we understand um, access in, um, to, in the public realm from a mobility perspective? Um, when we think about strengthening pathways to student retention, understanding what physical aspects of that we can do in this campus plan. Um, that help retain students, and then strengthening identity as a community-based hub for equity, centering student and community voice um, is very important as far as the programmatic uses and programs affiliated really um, within both campuses, and then prioritizing fiscal stewardship and sustainability. So I think as, as part of this, um, our, the DNA for the way we think about the physical com campus environments um, is, is going to be through that stewardship and a kind of sustainability um, aspect. And so how we, we think about energy usage, how we think about open space and landscape, how we think about mobility options all play into uh, a more sustainable kind of campus model. So if we move to the next slide, um, I'm going to begin with our analysis. Um, oh, just a moment is... on decarbonization, Marianne. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Tamar. Why don't you present the decarbonization, please? No, it's exactly the follow up, right? If we're prioritizing yeah. fiscal stewardship and sustainability, what does that mean? What does it mean for Middlesex Community College? And what does that mean for DCAM, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? So the strategic plan goes on to talk about core principles of financial and environmental sustainability. Let's look at infrastructure. Let's look at deferred maintenance. 
but always from this ethic of resource conservation and social justice. Let's find ways to study the future of the physical campus through through that lens in order to achieve sustainability, right? In order to be efficient, to be educated. Such a strong correlation with this Commonwealth of Massachusetts goals, right? DCAM has its decarbonization goals, Executive Order 594, leading by example, aims for all campuses, including Middlesex Community College, to be carbon neutral by 2050. What does that mean? Looking so closely at that energy use and other sources of carbon emissions to gradually reduce, reduce, reduce those emissions to zero by the year 2050. And that could unlock some potential uh, sources of funding or incentives or rebates as well that we hope working with Willa and her team of engineers at AEI to really study energy use and carbon emissions across the campus and find ways to, to make these uh, goals uh, part. Thank you, Miriam. Great, thank you. So as we move to analysis, um, I think that we want to start with number one, the two campuses and understanding how those two campuses connect through a mobility lens. Um, we understand Lowell as a more urban campus in nature, while Bedford is really um, suburban and more secluded. So how we leverage those different kind of characteristics of each context um, due to um, the urban nature of Lowell, um, more programs have moved to that campus. We understand that uh, really it's about a 70% to 30% split between um, the intensity of, of programs that have been um, kind of split between the two campuses. Um, and the goal is to really think about, you know, how can we offer unique and distinct offerings for each campus? What we also see in the image here is understanding that geographic position and understanding uh, driving times and what the kind of um, mobility uh, distance is relative to those who might travel through automobiles and so forth. And just understanding that distance and, and knowing how significant it is for those who have access to different types of transportation getting to each campus. If we move to the Lowell campus, um, we want to, you know, really move into understanding that greater context where we can see in this case um, labels that show where the academic um, and, and kind of support buildings are located um, relative to the Lowell campus, um, understanding how those facilities are knitted into an urban fabric um, and, and thinking through their kind of distance from each other and what's located within each. If we go to the next slide, we can look at an aerial kind of plan that again shows that kind of um, context for the campus, this urban campus. And then as we move to the next slide, um, really seeing the Lowell campus um, and understanding how you can leverage um, access to certain amenities because you are located downtown. And so knowing that whether it's food or fitness or ways that we're thinking about what the city offers, that can be built into the way that we think about this campus experience. So here you can see all the kind of buildings labeled relative to what makes up the MCC Lowell campus. Um, and knowing that those are probably within a 10 to 15 minute walk shed um, in, in regards to getting to these different facilities. If we move to the next slide, we can see that um, in this case, the Cowan Center is the main academic building on the Lowell campus. We see that in the middle of the screen in blue as academic uses. Um, the magenta color shows really the library use. Um, and orange is kind of knitted at a different scale with ways that we're thinking about student life with brown being more facilities. Um, the college is currently renting the Pollard Exchange Building, but this lease is, is ending soon, so we want to be aware of that. And then we also know that the college is subletting the space in the Annex Building. Um, so being aware of what types of 
facilities that we have in different locations. We can see that the Academic Arts Center is really has student life amenities built into it. That's why we see a kind of hatch with orange and blue. Um, but we know that there's other student life amenities that are spread throughout um, the different building uses that we're seeing on this campus. As we move then to the Lowell kind of campus buildings, um, we're understanding from our campus planning perspective, um, all the different types of um, spaces and programs that are located within each of the buildings um, and understanding what's the highest and best use of these locations and spaces, um, not only where they are, but thinking about the quantity and the quality of spaces that make up um, these different space types and different programs um, for the Lowell campus. So I think that we're aware of the kind of um, type of architecture that exists, uh, the building typology and how some of them are wider buildings that we have to really think about relative to how we understand service and access, but getting views to the city and natural light. Um, and then some really are, are fronting a cobblestone street in some cases where we have to think about accessibility and how one's moving to access these buildings. So all of those are part of our thinking. As we, as we move to the next slide, I will say that with those buildings and understanding the building stock, we want to understand the campus kind of um, through a building age perspective. So really everything that's seen in a lighter color of pink is the oldest buildings and everything that's like a darker shade are some of the newest buildings um, that have been built. And so we see in this case, the Academic Arts Center is, um, has been renovated in 2018, originally built in 1865. So part of this is really thinking through how do we renovate buildings in such a way that we respect that history, but we're also more cog cognizant of the way that we're thinking about 21st century learning and study environments with new technologies, and how do we do it in a sustainable way um, where we're really looking to decarbonizing um, the campus and thinking about energy use intensities um, as we think of each of these facilities. Um, all buildings on Lowell's campus are historic except for the Cowan um, Center. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. of notable historic properties include the Federal Building, which we know functions as your library, and the De Nesmith House, which is rented out for, for events. Um, so again, how are we stewards of these facilities, but how are they also helping in regards to how we shape that kind of learning um, and study environment that we need for each of the different types of um, programmatic uses on the campus. Um, as we look next to the next slide, uh, we see that federal building um, situated and how it really contributes to the main kind of um, thoroughfare and downtown um, Lowell location. Uh, but seeing really um, the kind of classrooms, the visual arts studios, and the community assembly room uh, contribute to that kind of interface between community and the campus community. If we move to the next slide, we are also looking at mobility and how can we think about different modes of movement as it relates to walking, rolling, um, bicycling, transit, public transit, to people who might use vehicles and need to park in certain locations. Um, from a walkability and open space kind of aspect as we think about health and wellness and how people have access to certain facilities, uh, we see that all buildings are within a 10 minute walking radius. Um, some of the key open spaces of the campus um, are, are really located as these pocket parks or ways that we understand the public realm situated around and adjacent to buildings. Um, but as if as we look at the Cowan Center, for example, we know that there are accessibility issues as it pertains to barriers of stairs and other means that make it harder for people to actually move um, into that kind of um, civic space. So we wanna be really mindful of what those opportunities are that address um, accessibility and also think about the public realm. If we move on to the next slide, what you'll see is some of those kind of snapshots that you all are probably very much so aware of. Uh, would love your insights into how you utilize these spaces or what would be better in regards to the design of these spaces and what your, your needs are relative to how you want to occupy these really beautiful outdoor spaces that overlook the canal and the city. If we go to the next slide, what you'll see is the Lowell Campus Student Life um, kind of amenities that we've pointed out here. We understand there's lots of student spaces that are located 
and Cowan Center with a cafe and student lounge, the federal building, of course, as your library, and then the academic arts center with dance recital rooms. Um, but there's also a lot of other different types of spaces that we want to be mindful of and how we capture and then thinking about how we, again, leverage what you have, but also take advantage of the city as a resource and think about the quality of those spaces and what your space needs are which moves us to the next kind of slide, which gets to campus affinity groups and community support. So we know it's wonderful to see um, as we're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, what are the different types of services and support in multicultural space or cultural based kind of programs that are affiliated with MCC? What are the types of spaces that are needed in regards to how those organizations and groups of people come together and what's needed for the future? So we really want to be mindful and hear what needs there might be in regards to the kind of affinity groups and culturally based organizations and, and community support. As we look at the environment um, on the next slide that looks to the public realm in regards to floodplains, um, we understand that there's a lot of different types of ownership in this downtown campus. Um, as we look at the canals, we look at the aqueducts that are under underneath a lot of the structures. Um, and then thinking about the kind of environmental impacts of where flooding may be happening, where there might be sinkholes underneath certain buildings, um, and realizing that we have to be really strategizing on what those types of um, changes will, will mean for the future of the campus. So you can see in the blue here that there's a um, kind of the waterways, what you'll know in, in the different shades of blue is like the 100 year floodplain and the 500 year floodplain. And then just seeing where those affect certain surface parking lots, structured parking, some of the annex building, um, just understanding that we want to really think about mitigating that flooding and understanding structurally what's going on, um, not just what we see, but what's below these buildings uh, and some of the invisible infrastructure systems that we don't see as part of this plan. So moving then to the Bedford campus, um, some of our site analysis, if we begin to, to really look at the Bedford campus, we're understanding um, the woodlands and all the different types of campus facilities that you have here and how they're organized around this major quad. Um, as we move to the next slide, um, we, we understand the kind of um, location of the Bedford campus as more secluded. Um, and surrounded really by the woodlands and by these different water bodies and being aware of that. We also understand its relationship to the expressway and vehicular access from that expressway from different parts of the region. Um, and, and then also thinking about the development patterns that have been emerging along this Northeast expressway and knowing that a tech park and different types of neighborhoods are really your neighbors around this property. And so how can we think through um, those different land use patterns and ownership patterns and how those might impact the future of the Bedford campus. And so as we zoom into this and looking at our aerial, we see this beautiful woodlands and the clearings that make up the more formal kind of uh, Bedford campus, as well as the facilities that we see on the right side of your screen from the campus core. If we move to the next slide, um, what you can see then is um, really the organization of the campus um, so facilities are surrounding this quadrangle and knowing that parking is on the periphery. So keeping it a super pedestrian oriented campus um, as you, you think about the core. If we move to the next slide, we are looking at um, all the different building uses again, understanding blue is academic. Um, that we have office space in the light blue, the library and the pink magenta, student life really uh, with the campus center, farmhouse, trustee house and the orange, and then seeing in the darker orange, the service facility. What we wanna note here is that we know that Henderson Hall is the main academic building that is planned for major renovations with new biotech labs. Um, and that this is a major kind of uh, capital investment um, for MCC at this time. So being aware of that and what's happening there, I think is very important. As we look at the different facilities on the next slide, we can see the kind of um, the character of each of these buildings um, and how they're working relative to the quad. Um, 
from the bookstore and understanding that the cafeteria and the center there um, to thinking about how these different buildings contribute in some way um, to the Bedford identity. Um, but, but for us looking at, you know, what's the highest and best use of this land? What buildings are really contributing and what are in conditions that are more challenging and should they remain or should they be rethought? as different types of sites for development, um, be it open space or um, new facilities. Um, if we move to the next slide then that builds upon this idea of um, what buildings are, are older and, and what are a little bit newer, um, what we can see here is that the darker buildings in this case are showing some of the buildings that have been there for um, quite a long time. And then as we move into the lighter color, we're starting to see buildings um, that were in the 1990s added. The trustees house is one of the oldest properties on campus and is currently underutilized. We know the North Academic um, and Concert Hall has potential for renovation. It would require significant capital investment. The Bedford house is in poor condition with inaccessible circulation and an outdated kind of HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, um, kind of building system unit, um, and that the South Academic Building is inaccessible or removed um, more so from the core. So we would just wanna be pretty mindful of how this is working into our, our analysis. If we move into the next slide, what we can see here is the, the kind of um, images that show those different types of buildings um, and, and thinking through what does the trustee house, what does the Bedford house uh, mean for the future of the Bedford campus, um, and then how would you think about building renovations and what would be the highest and best use for those renovated spaces on this campus. On the next slide, what we see here is that there's Again, the walkability and pedestrian circulation makes this a really strong core. Um, it's all within a five minute walking radius, really. Um, so that compactness is really great from a sustainability perspective and then making sure we're cleared out of areas where there are woodlands. Um, but we also have in the green, what you can see is the different types of um, kind of um, circuits and trails um, that are part of this beautiful setting. So what can we do to strengthen where those trails are in those settings? How are we learning from the woodlands as that kind of landscape laboratory um, for investigating ecosystems and ways that we can study um, environmental systems and so forth? Um, as we look at the quad on the next slide, we notice um, it was a cold day when we were there, so we see bits of snow, um, but we can imagine that this is a really active space potentially um, during days when it's a little sunnier and warmer. Uh, but how does this space function? How is it programmed as far as people hanging out there, studying there, socializing there, um, or having an active presence? We'd love to hear more about that from your all's perspective. Um, as we move to uh, the open space system uh, for campus open space, we can see um, that we have two cities uh, of which you can see that dashed line um, of where the campus property begins to extend past. Um, we also see that a large percentage of the vacant land in the campus boundary is categorized as wetland. So cannot just be thinking about this as like, oh, let's develop it um, for revenue generation so easily. It's something that we have to be mindful of what can be developed and what cannot be developed and what's a more sustainable pattern of development should there be any on this campus. Um, and then I think that in this case, we can see that there's conservation land and uh, wetlands and wooded areas, quads and interstitial spaces as part of that makeup. Um, and as we move to the next slide, I think that from that kind of um, landscape perspective, which we know to be very important to this campus, we also wanna look at key destinations um, on the campus. And so looking at the library and campus center as being primary destinations for the campus community, and, and then understanding that with the teleworking kind of policy and people working remotely, um, you know, how are things being utilized on this campus? Um, not only understanding where the destinations are, but areas where um, there's not a lot of people on the campus, for example, on a Friday. Um, so what does that mean in, as far as the way that we use our resources uh, for those different types of spaces and what's being activated on the campus at different times of the week? Um, and with that, I think that 
Um, that concludes a snapshot of our analysis that gives you a sense of what we're thinking. We have a whole body of space planning that we are in the middle of and kind of beginning to understand um, how that relates to what we're hearing with different campus groups um, and hearing from folks like yourself. Um, as we move to this next slide, I guess our ending slide in this process, um, some of the key discussion points that we want to call attention to are, are there any thoughts on the analysis of the physical campus environments that we've talked about today that we should know for this campus planning effort? What are the things that we're missing or we should be paying attention to as we keep going on this kind of um, journey with MCC? Um, are there any additions to the campus analysis that we should explore um, in the future as we're starting to really think through um, assumptions for how we can think about the future with different scenarios or concept alternatives? And right, so Marianne. I think that, yeah, yep, thank great, you for that. thank you. Uh, yeah. Sudeshna, if we could climb off the screen sharing there, uh, we'll get back to the, to the gallery view here. Um, you know, they, they have a, a 90 plus slide presentation looking at really drilling into the analysis of each building, each classroom, taking a look at what they've been observing over five plus years worth of data, and, and as well as the energy utilization for those properties. So that's what's being um, processed simultaneously to, to our conversations here. But um, I think the thing that we really want to hear from folks is some maybe some ideas you've been kicking around um, in the in the back of your mind especially those of you who are in your, your um, classrooms what you've seen um, I know in the conversations that I've been part of you know we've heard a lot of uh, feedback about current uh, conditions in some of the rooms and um, we, we're trying to take a, a fresh eye approach to, to some of those especially on the um, Bedford campus where maybe some of the buildings are in need of some TLC and haven't had it for a while so um, especially for faculty who are in uh, different types of classrooms. We want to hear what, what your needs are. I know, like I said, many of you have been helping us with the advisory group and we're going to be um, convening that group back together again. But um, now is certainly the, the time and Phil, I'll toss it to you and then we can open it up for, um, for, for general questions. But we really uh, truly want to hear what folks have to, have to think. Sure, thanks Patrick. And, and thanks Marianne for, for just sort of the overview. Um, what what I would tell folks is this was designed as an opportunity for us to talk about a number of things that may be ideas that have been bouncing around in your head for a while. Let me give you a couple of parameters that were really important in our conversation with Sasaki and DCAM. So you have a sense of um, sort of our thinking at the leadership level. Um, in this fall, we will be in a round of an opportunity of an every two year process to apply for a capital project. And part of that has been part of doing this plan help to inform what that capital project will be. Uh, and I think that that's why your input is so important. Um, the second piece I'd say is that, and, and, and Ellen, please, Ellen Whitmore from DCAM, please correct me if I'm, if I'm incorrect. But those capital projects have been mostly projects that have been extended based on collaboration, but also on the idea that we have to tackle our deferred maintenance. So when we talk about uh, having $96 million worth of deferred maintenance, that means that not all of our buildings will survive uh, this process. And in fact, since the pandemic, it's quite clear that we don't need all of our buildings based on the classroom utilization that we've seen on both campuses, which is by this, the details of that piece are so important. Uh, I think it's important for us to think about the conversation about specifically uh, on the Lowell campus, we lease a facilities building that is still incredibly important to us. And we actually have subleases uh, under that building. So, uh, but, but the one lease that we do have that we have great control over is the Pollard building lease. So we've had conversations about how do we over the next year remove ourselves from that lease in the Pollard building and move uh, the programs and the activities that are in that building to another space, whether that be in Lowell or Bedford. Okay, so that's that's on the table, but I want you all to know that uh, in a conversation with the Board of Trustees around our, our, our budget, 
and uh, for what we're looking at in Lowell that we uh, moved away from the purchase of the Pollard Building and now are working towards moving out of the Pollard Building. And I think that's really a new scenario based on classroom use utilization and what we know about what's happening uh, with face-to-face -face classes and online classes. Second piece for Bedford is that we have a number of buildings that will be significant cost to us to continue to maintain uh, inside the quad and outside of the quad. Uh, first couple of areas would be specifically uh, Bedford House, uh, which has been uh, part of a conversation here for over a decade about what do we do with that building. Um, and, and my guess is that one of those things is that as we look at a master plan for Bedford, it would be taking that building down would be part of one of the things that we think is a serious consideration in our next capital project effort. Uh, and the other question is, how do we really focus on the quad itself and moving ourselves out of potentially uh, South Academic and consolidating classroom space? Uh, so those are the things that we've had some initial conversations about. Those things have been on the table simply because in order for us to be successful in this next capital project and for us to do a good job with this facilities master plan, we have to think about what has happened in terms of our enrollment reduction, where we're using space, how do we utilize space for the best kinds of opportunities to do hands-on work with students, which we know is still driving students to campus on both campuses. So I'm just laying that framework for you to have some uh, more detailed reactions and thoughts, but we're seriously, very seriously open to all of your comments. Now, we do wanna tell you, Sasaki is not gonna decide what furniture you get in what, what classroom. Uh, we can talk about the, uh, the, the, the needs of refurbishing a number of classrooms on both campuses, and we're making progress with that annually. But I think when we talk about that, but when we're talking about co-location of offices and classrooms and what, what kinds of needs do people see that we've not been able to address before because we've never really attacked this from a master plan perspective. So I'm opening that conversation up and then uh, we're open to all your comments. Joanna, you want to start? Um, yeah, hi everybody. Um, thank you for that. I'd, I'd love to see the 90 slideshow, not on a Zoom meeting um, <laughs> at some point. <laughs> um, and we're happy to share that with you because the details are rather fast. Yeah, it'd be it'd be really fun to see the details on that. Um, three things. The money's every two years um, through DCAM for deferred. Is it only for deferred maintenance? And is no. it guaranteed? Let, let me back up on that. So okay. we receive deferred maintenance monies now from uh, the state to address some of our more our, our, okay. our facilities issues that we have on a project list. What I'm saying is the larger issue of any expansion, change, et cetera, is requiring us to go and think about, can't think about something new or something that's renovated without making really clear two things. One, how are you going to utilize that space? How are you going to drive students to that space? What will it do to revitalize the campus? And the second piece is the carbon footprint. How do we continue to work on uh, what Tamara and others have talked about in terms of this decarbonization? Because there is that tug and pull there. When you have older buildings, uh, they're not necessarily as efficient as you would like them to be. And what we're seeing from the decarbonization report that will be very cool for all of you to see is there's a, a sort of a software project and product that they create that it will tell you in each and every one of our buildings, if we are to change X, this is how much money you would save and this is how we would eliminate parts of the carbon footprint. So it's really going to be a very useful tool when the, once the decarbonization project is complete as well. So Joanne, I'm, I, I don't wanna give you the sense that we don't already receive money from the state for deferred maintenance, but if you if you get the idea that we're gonna get three or 4 million every couple of years even, um, we're not gonna to get to the 96. And that 96 million is just gonna to continue to grow. So it is a problem. Thank you. Um, so then my next question is probably silly, but um, is it, and this is one thing I think of even at my house, like, is it almost cheaper to start from scratch on a new building, right? Instead of doing all these patchwork things in all these different buildings, right? Because it can be built specifically for carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it could be a green building, et cetera. Um, and, and clearly we have just the spot because Bedford House needs to be raised. Um, and then just 
you know, so I don't know if that's a potentiality cut down the road, a new building. I don't know if uh, our friends at state of Massachusetts would want to buy that. I think and it's a great question. I'm happy, I'm happy to address well. that. Yes, I'm happy to address that. I think it's a great question, Joanna. We will analyze that on a case by case basis, and we will be trading off what are the benefits to reduce operational carbon from energy use versus what's called embodied carbon or upfront carbon. And I, uh, so so existing buildings have a lot of value and we will just case case by case basis. Thank you. The, the so, other, the, just the third piece real quick is like, my head immediately goes to, okay, so we're doing this project, we're rehabbing, we're refurbishing cl potential classroom space, labs, things. What do we do in the meantime? Where do we go? So is that par obviously part of the plan? And I, I imagine that will impact, if I may say, order of operations, how things sort of work out um, based on the planning of where we can go temporarily yeah, to hold it's a great question, Joanna. I'm going to turn it over to Ellen in a minute, but I do want to tell you that as part of what DCAM requires of, of us, and as part of anything we would do in identifying any renovation or any new building, we have to articulate very carefully exactly what we're going to do with existing space and people in the meantime, right, while the renovation is going on. They're very, very thorough about making sure that that is part of the presentation. Um, but I do want to assure you that when you start looking at the 90 pages, you will see just how many empty classrooms, just how, how low our utilization is, that we would not have a problem moving classrooms and activities and academic activities around in that case, if we needed to make some changes or renovations specifically, and even more so on the Bedford campus. I'm sorry, Ellen, please. Oh, I was just going to go back a little bit to say, um, you know, for the last several years, there's been much more emphasis, and this is kind of coming from the governor's office, on reusing what we can uh, and maybe not building quite so much new, not that you can if you really need it, of course. Um, but, you know, it's, it has to do with sustainability and kind of putting our money where our mouth is sort of thing and kind of really trying to make an effort to be sustainable and think that through and bal balance, you know, I mean, I know sometimes the condition of the building can be quite dreadful. So, you know, we do see that, but in other hand, you want to be careful not to just throw something out when you could probably use reuse it and reuse it well. So it's always it takes study. You know, it takes a lot of it takes a team. Yeah. Uh, That's true, Ellen. And I, I would just use some of our recent renovation to sort of like the dental clinic. Uh yeah. and the biotech yeah. like like look at that in those very old buildings, yeah. what beautiful new facilities can be created even yeah. when you have an outside shell, but you have all the infrastructure that is there. So Ellen's talking about like, would it be cheaper for us to renovate Henderson Hall rather than build a new building, Joanna? And the answer is yes. Thank you. I have some um, comments that have come through Phil um, to me that I can share um, and a couple of questions. Um, one, the community garden was not mentioned or displayed on the Bedford maps. Um, will that be part of the existing sustainability features? Oh, absolutely. And there's actually no, there's no activity or use that is academic in nature directly connected to that. But I mean, we have lots of opportunities for open spaces, including that community garden for a reconnection. So there's no plan to change any of those things because all of that enhances the Bedford campus. It does not detract from it and it enhances academic connections, possibilities in the future or work with co-curricular work. In fact, we've had student government uh, a couple of years ago ask us for bees. Like how do, how do we attract more bees to the Bedford campus? Because, you know, and, and we've often talked about solar panels on the Bedford campus. We've talked about, you know, in the past, we've talked about wind turbines. I mean, there's there's lots of things for us to discuss around the issues of sustainability. And in fact, we've, you know, we've moved in that direction with the trustees house there. So, I mean, we have, although that's a very expensive 
effort to get that done. It was through a grant that we were able to accomplish that for Trustees House. Um, so I think uh, that's a great question, but there is no plan. In fact, the larger question is, how do we enhance the quad and the outside areas? Can we create outside classrooms and opportunities for faculty to use uh, some of the outside space that we've always wanted to? You know, I wanted to, you know, create a patio there for functions, et cetera, uh, until we learned just how expensive it would be to pour cement to create a patio. So uh, I think that all of this is on the table, which is why we want to have these conversations. But no, I don't. I don't see any reason to think that the space that we are currently using along the trail along the side there would ever take away the community garden. In fact, the question is, is that something we'd want to expand on in the future? Thank you, Phil. Um, there are a couple comments um, that I've received regarding accessibility and how that's important. Um, and has there been any talk about involving our students from our formerly DSS, now SAS department, um, in regards to the barriers that they experience and getting their ideas for um, accessibility improvements? Yeah, I, I would guess that our SAS, our folks that work in the SAS department would be able to tell us because of the accommodations that need to be made on a regular basis, exactly where some of those pain points are. We're very aware, we've, we've had a complete report on that, we know exactly where the pain points are, uh, but having student voice engaged in that is something that I think we've heard time and time again. We know that we're in very old facilities, and for the folks that are new to SAS, there's plenty of reports to show you of exactly all of the issues that we have with accessibility on both campuses, and happy to share those reports with you. Next, uh, do we know where roof repair slash replacement is on the priority list? Sure, which roof? Which building? This did not specify. No, we've got lots of roof problems. So yeah, yeah. So so which building? What that's the ninety-six million dollars in deferred maintenance, right? So I mean, yeah, I mean, when we think about it in terms of what we'd like to do if this potential for any renovation in Henderson Hall, that's going to require an entirely new roof on Henderson Hall. Right. So it depends on which direction we go in, uh, which buildings stay remain active. Uh and as part of the current deferred maintenance list, and Allie, I think you'd have to say where we are with, with the plans for using those dollars, if Allie's on. I don't know if she's on. I am. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, yep. So we're in the midst of planning the DCAM spend for the deferred maintenance for the next tranche of money, which is fiscal year 24 to 28. Um, a lot. I don't have it up in front of me. But a lot of the works that we have planned are for, we have some boilers, which are very costly. We have a couple roofs um, at the parking uh, lot and the accessibility into the Cowan Center are also at the forefront of it. Um, $8 million is spent very quickly, especially after post-pandemic and the inflation. So we have some major projects and we're trying to synergize where we can with this master plan um and so um that is what we have planned right now we're still kind of nailing down the details depending on certain results and the way things go yeah and and you know that that's a little more complicated in the city of lowell than it is in bedford bedford seems a little more isolated and we have some opportunity although we learned a lot with that va parking lot that we're, we we do still have bedford neighbors that have a lot to say about what we do um so what i would say is that every one of those deferred maintenance plans changes over time depending on the conversations with the city so for example the city of lowell has had some extensive conversation with us about sort of the canal way and there's been a lot of discussion about who owns what land around the building and whether or not we'd be able to maintain that what kind of insurance would that look like how would we really be able to flatten some of those bricks i mean we're seeing what's happening in the sinkhole just on the steps on the front of the cowan building which is now cement as opposed to brick you may be wondering why we didn't price that with brick because you know all of this is about how do we deal with things that are most immediate and most urgent so what ends up happening is no matter how well we plan something more urgent seems to come up that spends that money a lot faster uh, than you would think as Allison has identified. But we can, and Allison, once you find that document in terms of what we presented to the board, we can drop that here in the chat if you would. Um, and, and that might give people a sense of our most recent projects that we've been talking about. 
I would only add that I, you know, I, I do think the timing is right for the this master plan, the decarbonization study, um, working with DCAN. There, there is opportunity to build a case for when we talk about the decarbonization stuff and in Massachusetts having its own goals for energy efficiency, we certainly can. The goal is to collect this information, be able to hopefully piggyback on some of it and be able to take advantage of state money down the road um, where we can't necessarily uh, speak to it in this next you know, five, four year plan of the, the deferred maintenance. So there's opportunity there. We just gotta get all our ducks in a row to take the most advantage that we can. That, Beth, there's been some comments in the chat. Maybe we can go through them as well and try and answer and give people some, some feedback. Yeah, sure. Phil, I have a bunch of chats that have come directly to me. That okay, well, I think what would be great is if people, as I always love, like you're here, we're all here together. Um, we would be love to have you come on camera and ask the question. So I appreciate why you're sending it to Beth, but I think we've had enough critical conversations and open dialogue that there should be, there's no fear factor in this. We really want to hear from you or we wouldn't be spending the two hours doing it. And so therefore we hope that you won't just use Beth as your conduit, but also get on, raise your hand and, and ask a question. So we're happy to hear you and see you. All right, so we do have one that came in through um, from um, Camille Brown on the Bedford map, the farmhouse and trustees buildings are labeled as student life. Could you explain why? Uh, just a mistake. I mean, basically that's where the, that's where legal is. And, you know, anyone who has levels of familiarity. So those are not student activity buildings. They've just been identified because we, when we tour through there, there's a lot of to digest about two campuses and a number of buildings, but they've been mislabeled. Great. Susan, your hand is raised. I'm sorry, my video is not working. Um, what I would like to mention is that I find with the emphasis on attracting older students to the campus and that being a fairly successful um, marketing um, approach that students that I meet with are looking for more face-to-face -face classes. And just as an example, today out of um, six students I met, Four of them expressly ex um, wanted face-to-face -face courses in the summer and the fall. So I thought that might be important information for people who are planning um, rehabs and renovations of interior spaces. Yeah. Susan, I'm really glad you brought that point up because I've had a conversation with Arlene and all of the deans recently as they were developing uh, sort of the schedule for the fall about the fact that that continues to come up from adults. And I think that uh, as we're going to continue to look at Mass Reconnect and new populations that we can serve, you're absolutely right. Students are going to need and want more face-to-face -face or hybrid classes that they can access, meet their instructor, meet others. There's a socialization component to this that is important. And secondly, when we talk about the vitality of both campuses, you know, I've asked that before the final schedule is done, that we review at the, the leadership level both the activities for face-to-face -face on the law and the Bedford campus to make sure that we have a balancing act. So we're uh, we're working on it, Susan, but thanks for bringing that up. It's critically important. And in fact, we know that students are coming in uh, that especially in a, a number of hands-on programs that that those hands-on spaces, those, those specialized spaces are really important to students as well. Uh, so we're gonna have to talk about, you know, where are our more uh, lecture-based chalk and talk kinds of classrooms and where will be our, then the technology that's needed for them and how do we focus on some of the more hands-on opportunities and where does that get focused in Bedford and Lowell? So it's a great point. Great Thank news. You, Phil. Um, we have a comment slash question from Stacy Hargis in the chat about creating more public facing space for students where they can share their work and their art and their businesses. Pat, you had um, thoughts on this? Sure, um, thanks for that, Stacey. Um, I'm sorry, you moved on my camera, I said, there you go. Um, so we have been in conversation, actually now for over four years with a group from within the city of Lowell. Um, and unfortunately there was significant turnover of personnel that were involved with this project from the city of Lowell, um, especially during COVID. So the, all the individuals who started the conversational on that front are no longer working with the city, but 
Um, Allison Chambers and I have been um, meeting with the city regularly to take a look at the footprint directly around Cowan. And you'd be shocked at who owns what around us and how little is actually owned by us. Um, the city owns a significant portion of it. Uh, the state owns a part of it with um, parks and then the national park owns a big piece of it out back. And then the locks and canals or whatever the NL has morphed into these days um, owns a, a stretch of that as well. So the actual footprint that we have the ability to do work on or invest money in is um, remarkably small. So Phil and Ali and I are working with the city to try to address that, to see if we can enter into some kind of a uh, new agreement with the city to access a little bit bigger footprint, which would give us the opportunity to do some of the work potentially that you're talking about. But um, it, to, to, to really boil it down to its basis level, you can pretty much, if you're touching the wall of Cowan and reach your other arm out, that's pretty much our footprint alongside the, the building. So that Primo Canal space along with the National Park uh, trolley is, none of that is ours. And it's um, it's really kind of shocking at how little real estate we've got around that, that building itself. But um, that's certainly something I'll try to um, bring back to that group to talk to about opportunities that we could do with that because in my opinion is grievously underutilized by all of the, the, uh, the partners. Yeah, agreed. And Stacey, you know, I we've had this conversation before. It's a really important point. Um, a lot of people would like to have more forward-facing space, especially in the kind of program that you uh, that you're involved in. Um, it, do you have particular uh, buildings in mind when you talk about that? Uh, I'm just curious about hearing if you had any additional thoughts about other particular because it, to create and to take the buildings that we currently have and rehab those buildings with more glass, et cetera. I mean, we're, that's that's a huge undertaking, but I think our, maybe you have some specific buildings that you're curious about. Um, maybe like the um, the wall space in Pollard or the, the one that's across the street, I always forget, the Derby building. Like, could there be something in that, you know, doorway when you walk in that could be like a more traditional kind of retail space kind of setting? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that the issue is that the, the buildings that we technically have that have that kind of forward-facing piece, Pollard, we're going to get out of the lease, so Pollard's off the table. And then when we start talking about our two other buildings, those buildings are inhabited by um, health programs and pretty centralized. And so there, that, that space has become common space for students to hang or to be able to. So an idea of reconfiguring that space is an interesting one, but I think one of the things that we can talk about in this plan is what are those buildings that actually have forward facing opportunities and how do we capitalize on them? So thanks for bringing that up. Stacy. one other good point on that that's really important here and it's something that we are striving to try to address is the park area in between Derby and Talbot. It's actually a city owned park. Um, we have explored multiple conversations of us doing some of the work, some, some different things in that space because to me, that's a primo location for potentially some of the stuff you're talking about. Um, and we've made headway in the last year where they've actually, they pruned back all the trees for us. Um, we were allowed to do murals on Talbot building, but not on Derby and the window replacements are underway there right now. But that that open area, um, they, they cleared up the tree cover overhead and has really dramatically opened it up to make it a lot more inviting. Uh, but we, we've been in conversation with the city about potentially like adopting that park to a degree where that might be a, an optimal spot for you, other than the fact that it's, you know, it's on a cobblestone street that that, that does have some accessibility issues you know, in and of itself. Plus, there's no parking that's attached to it. It's just a walk up uh, park. But that, that could be someplace we could look at with you um, for some other ideas, especially in the, uh, the, the good weather. Thank you, Carmen. I'm going to open it up to you. Great. So um, hopefully you can hear me. Everybody can hear me. So I want to talk to you about the, the concert hall, no surprise. So in our case, in the music program, we have 50-50, 50% of the classes in Lowell and 50% of the classes in the concert hall. It's our only music space in Bedford. So it's interesting to hear the 70-30, ours is 50-50. Um, we have a concert series, as everyone knows, in community events. That's also 50-50, 50% in the concert hall, 50% in Lowell. Um, some reasons to renovate this concert hall, it would be great. First of all, it has beautiful acoustics. 
Uh, it has great rental possibilities. I mean, I'm always getting people to call if they want to rent the space for their recitals, for different things. They like the location. There's parking. They come and take a look at the hall. They see the hole in the wall and they say, no, thank you. So I think that just even some minor renovations, patching up some things would attract some income that would come in because it's a really beautiful space. Um, and we have a decent piano. And so that would be something. It also could be used for meetings. It could be used for clubs. I mean, it's something that um, there's a little bit of help I think could be used even more than it already is and the comments I get from the Bedford audience we have a very robust Bedford crowd that comes that they like the parking it is very hard for them to find parking in Lowell when they go to the recital hall in Lowell one of the reasons they'd like to come to Bedford they like the hall the acoustics but they also like that they can park and very easily so for in our case to have the the concert hall renovated even just slightly would be a huge advantage and I think it would be an advantage to the college as well yeah, Carmen, you saw that on the slide because the Sasaki people also were very attracted to that space in terms of what could happen right. there and what a beautiful space it is and that it does need uh, renovation. So that was there. And the issue is sort of what's, what we have to figure out is what's co-located in that particular building. And, and so we have to think a little bit about what belongs in Henderson. What belongs. In the past, things have sort of happened very willy-nilly. This gives us a chance to think about scheduling and opportunities to sort of focus where things are, and uh, so that that they were very attracted to the space when they saw it too. It's a beautiful space. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have a question here. Um, has there been any consideration for non-academic uses for potentially superfluous uh, properties on the Bedford campus? Hmm. Wow. Funny that you would say that. Uh, so uh, the answer is hmm. Yes. If you look at the campus map, and I don't want anyone to call that up again, Marianne, but you'll notice that that opening space to the Bedford campus uh, is actually in part of it's in built. It, it's part of it. You know that the, the campus is not only in Bedford. The whole meadow is in Bill Ricca. Yeah, Everything right. leading right. up to the uh, farmhouse and a lot is in Bill Ricca. Right. And so the question mark about that space and it's. Uh, and and whether or not it's too close to wetlands, the other piece of it is oh, there's a lot of wetlands on the Bedford campus, but there's also a lot of parking lots now that are not being used, right? Um, so the other conversation is the out towards the facilities building, and of course, if we were to tear down one building and move things out of uh, South Academic, right, because it's not part of the want to bring things into the quad, um, then what would South Academic become? And could that be something that the city wants to take over in terms of a building? Could that be something that the state wants to take over? I was just with the governor and lieutenant governor, and they are very excited about finding space for housing. Number one problem in the state, housing. So is there a way to renovate buildings that already exist? And they have asked higher ed facilities. And so I've you know, kind of tapped the lieutenant governor on the shoulder and said, when you want to come down and look at the Bedford campus, we're happy to, we're happy to give you a tour of what may be possible, but I think about an exciting uh, housing development that would be on the Bedford campus where we would have a deal that a certain number of those uh, units would be for our own faculty. We could attract additional faculty uh, to the Bedford area. It's a beautiful area to live. So there's lots of things that we've talked about. Um, I think what ends up happening is it all comes down to will and expense. And so we'll see how this plays out. But I think uh, that's why it's so important that we have our DCAM partners with us through this process because um, you know Ellen's insights into things that have been done on other campuses, things that are being done uh, at the other higher ed institutions is really uh, invaluable to our process of thinking what could be on the Bedford campus because it's a space we don't have that space in Lowell actually. So, thank you, Phil. Winnie, you had had your hand up, but now I see it's down. Do you have a question still? Um, I think Phil answered part of it in terms okay. of the Pollard building, so. All yes. right, great, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm combining two comments slash questions here. Has the college thought about electric cars for the college's fleet vehicles and solar panels? Yeah, and actually as part of this plan, as part of the issue around sustainability, we have to think about that, right? Because we have to think about our own parking lots, folks who are, need to use those facilities. Um, we know that there are people, because we're so close to the highway, it would be a particular attraction to have people drive off, park their car, be able to charge it, right? So yes, there's lots of discussion around that. And I would think that as we move to a final plan, that will be 
part of that plan as well. Critically important. As for Lowell, I think the whole issue that we've had this conversation is about sort of what happens in the Lowell garages that don't belong to us, they belong to the city. So it's a conversation with them about their own strategic plan and they're currently going through a planning process, but also it would be sort of how do we uh, identify ways that we can use the front parking lot uh, to be able to consider that. So yeah, those discussions are ongoing and they're important, but they are an important part of this plan because of the decarbonization, because our efforts to really make sure that we're creating sustainable campuses on both campuses. Thank you, Phil. Um, that is a great segue into the next question. Um, the parking situation, especially in Lowell, is um, challenging. Has this been included in the problem solving analysis as part of the master plan? It's a great question. I mean, I, it, if you go to any campus on any higher education, I don't know if any of you've worked at other higher education institutions, there are two things that people talk about all the time food service. That students talk about too. Food service and parking, right? It's universal, the universal problem. It's more of a problem, certainly in the city of Lowell, because we don't currently own our own parking garage or parking spaces. And so that is a natural discussion all the time with the city about the kind of partnership that's required. You know, I, um, we have talked with them many times about how important those garages are to the flow for our faculty and staff and for students. Um, so I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation, and I think we're going to have to explore everything we can about parking, and it is a major focus of the city's strategic plan in terms of their conversations going forward in order to attract people to downtown and to make sure that some of the biggest you know, employers and institutions that are important to the city of Lowell, such as Lowell General Hospital, such as Middlesex Community College and UMass Lowell, um, we have to be in that mix if the city wants to continue to have us in the city and engaged. And so, yeah, it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, it, it Sometimes I feel it would be great if we would be able to own or maintain our own garage. Uh, that would be terrific because it would solve a lot of our problems. But along with that comes all sorts of expense and maintenance and deferred maintenance. So you can't you can't win on some of this, but we have annual agreements that we discuss with the city about the parking garages and parking. And I think the city is wrestling with this whole idea of metered parking and all of the problems that we have had and students have had and all of us have had with the parking meters that don't, you know, the meters that don't work when you have to go park in a space, run down, you go to the meter, it doesn't work, you have to run to another one. I live in the city, so I know how complicated that is. That is not only hurting our business, it's hurting small business and local business in downtown Lowell. So I can assure you, that just at a meeting last week when we were discussing the, the city's master plan, we have raised parking as a significant issue in our partnership with the city. Great, thank you. Um, I do have a, a message from our student trustee. She's asked that I read it. Um, from a student perspective, she says that students would be interested in more outdoor spaces, energy efficiency, as well as spaces where they can congregate. A lot of the Bedford spaces are small and are not able to house those student, students who want to meet for club meetings. Yeah, and, and lots of times we've talked about sort of uh, how we might create some outside classrooms on the Bedford campus, but I think faculty have asked for that. Student clubs sorry, have asked for that as well, meeting spaces. That was the idea behind the creation of the patio where we used to put the tent directly out of our enrollment building uh, was that the concept was that it would be easy to pitch a tent. It would be able to use it at various times during, and we'd be able to put picnic tables and umbrellas and opportunities out there. So I think that you're onto something in terms of what we need to do to explore outdoor space. And I think that if we can work with the city to identify uh, renovation of some of the land around the the, the main Cowan building, um, that's also an opportunity to really renovate some of those picnic benches and areas for outside space um, for people to eat, to be able to be able to get out and, and have meetings. So yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's an important one, both that we've heard from faculty and students. So I'm glad that you mentioned it. Another comment, um, it would be great to have the second floor of the campus center on Bedford more open and visible to students. Uh, yeah, well, because it, well, as it was designed, it's kind of hidden. Nobody, nobody knows where the second floor is. There's lots of wall. Yeah, I, I get it. I completely get that. What kind of renovation that would take to be able to create glass? I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, uh, when you talk about 
removing walls and adding glass, uh, it's it's not necessarily the most sustainable thing to do. Uh, it's, it's also sort of sometimes the most expensive thing to do. So maybe that's something we have to tackle with signage, with better signage and with a better way to identify the different parts of that beautiful student building, because it is a beautiful building. Um, and, and maybe it could use some renovation in terms of how students use it. But um, I think that there are places on both of our campuses that are mysteries to students, like places mm -hmm. that people, students don't know what's on that floor or that area. But that's certainly one of them, uh, that if you mm -hmm. don't know that that's where major offices are, especially for co-curricular, et cetera. And maybe that's something that we need to rethink as we're moving some spaces around is something to think about is, is that the optimum place for those particular functions to be? Um, and that's something we can decide. I mean, that's not gonna be part of a, a master plan, but we certainly do have the space to be able to figure this out. So that second floor, the um, the work that was done there over there in the last year uh, by Jonathan and folks to turn that food pantry, to move the food pantry out of Bedford House into there, um, they've got primo space there, which is really gorgeous. It's a gorgeous. great drop-in uh, spot for the for the uh, for the food pantry. But as you know, the you know the veterans are in that building. Multicultural is there. Um, you know, student engagement. So there are you know there might be other ways we can help market that space a little bit better, so folks do um, know what's up there. But I will laud that um, that that the food pantry relocation is a huge step that was very uh, positive because they've got a terrific setup up there right now. And I know that Jonathan and people have been using it um, pretty consistently. So, yeah. And I think that we also have to recognize that if Bedford House does come down, if it is torn down, then we've got faculty offices we've got to deal with. We have a prayer space there that has to be accommodated, a space for mothers for lactation space. So there are spaces that are in the Bedford House that would need to be absorbed elsewhere. So um, it isn't as simple as just saying, we're gonna tear a building down. We've got to figure out where everything fits. All right, I do not see any other comments in the chat that have not, uh, or ideas or questions. Oh, but Ava, I see your hand just went up. You are muted. Uh, hi, uh, probably this question is, uh, with all due respect to Phil, this question is probably for Sasaki, whoever can answer it. Uh, it's more into like a theoretical question or a technical question. Uh, for uh, the decarbonization uh, effort, what, what option do you have and what that option that could apply for uh, uh, MCC, basically. Can you, I, I mean, based on your uh, initial assessment that you just presented to us just now, I, I don't know who will answer that, probably someone from Sasaki. Um, Willa, are you still with us here? I'm sorry, I've lost you off my screen. I lost Willa and I lost Tamar, who might be able oh, to answer the question. Well, yep. so, so I, I mean, I can't answer that the way they <laughs> might, but I can say, um, you know, we have, we at DCAM have been charged with decarbonizing all the campuses. And there's been a stronger and stronger push behind this developing over the years, you know, coming down from the, gov the governor's office. And we have a very strong in-house group that deals just with sustainability and resilience that really kind of scrutinize all this and help support us in this. So we take it very seriously. So I don't know exactly what will be proposed. I just know it'll be paid attention to. Yeah, I, I think even what I have seen, and I, I'm excited to show folks when we get to a point where they're a little further along in the process, but each building, uh, the software that I talked about, gives us options about changes that we could make to the building uh, and the expense, what it would cost us to make those changes, and then what would be the savings to making those changes. So I think that um, there's a whole presentation just on the decarbonization piece. And you're right, no offense, Eva, there's no way I would attempt to answer that. But I think that we have experts that are part of this process that when we have the final report, they're gonna have some very significant uh, recommendations and give us multiple options for each building that we currently own. Uh, okay, so it's it's like uh, every building different. It's not like the whole- uh... Correct. Collaboration. Okay, so it's. Very I think I think there'll be some general recommendations made that we could do across the campus for all buildings, and then there's going to be some things yeah. that are going to be very building specific. 
based on the age of the building, what we've what we've done already in terms of uh, trying to address energy issues, et cetera. So I think it's going to be the way this software works and the way we've had access to it from what we've seen is it's very specific by building with all of the other issues that that particular building has to be able to make recommendations for changes. Okay, I guess have to wait. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm thinking like uh, any other option outside of, I see a lot of like uh, solar panel or uh, use more window, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that, that's more, that's more really, more really technical, optional. Like I see Joanna mentioned about Intel, Pebralia, what, what is Intel in this decarbonization uh, process will be uh, that you might well suggest to MCC? So Ava, I can't answer part of that question, but um, I don't want to speak for the folks who are doing that piece of the study. I, I can tell you because it actually just happened while we were on this call, but we're getting um, Allison and her team down in finance have just called up uh, about five or six more years worth of our gas utilization information because what they're taking a look at is what types of energy, you know, what's the primary energy sources for some of these buildings, but to very specifically beyond like just solar, they're exploring also the potential for um, whether or not geothermal could be a, an option for us to pursue. Um, I know that, you know, they're drilling it down even to the degree of, you know, what type of um, LED lights we've got in some of the classrooms, making sure we've got the motion activated lights in all these classrooms. Um, it's it's really gonna be uh, every single, there's 18 buildings, um, depending on how many come out the other side of this report, each one of the buildings may have different findings and, and uh, recommendations for utilizations. I know one of the things Phil has talked about uh, quite frequently is solar panels on the roof above us here at Cowan. Uh, we got, you know, there's a flat roof up there, but they're gonna have to be some, they'd have to be some significant um, shoring up of that roof before we were able to add that, you know, that kind of an array up there. But those are the, um, e each building I think is gonna come back with some, potentially distinctive recommendations for, for uh, depending on which campus. Okay, thank you. Joanna, did you have a question? Well, I, I think I was just bouncing off of Eva saying, look, what's an, I'm sorry, what's an example of something that you would do for decarbonization? And, and Patrick just said, so installation of LED lights or looking at gas utilization, switching yeah. to, okay. I, and I think that's what people are probably looking for, just kind of yeah. beat on the ground, like real simple. Up, like, what is that? Updating mean? HVAC systems. I okay. mean, it goes on and on. In fact, right. what's interesting about this is that for each building, they will be able to say for the nature and age of that building, what are the things that you can do? What does it cost to do that? And then, um, so it will give us a real sense of what the projects could be as we begin to tackle this. So, thank you, Joanna. Ed. Yeah, just uh, three small things. Um, if we were to look at like redoing some things in the campus center at Bedford, what about the cafe? East and West has a use for us as faculty and staff when we have our big meetings, but for the students, every time I walk by at least, and I'm in and out of there a lot, it seems to be underutilized at this point. So maybe we could take half the cafe and turn it into a student life center so we can still open it up for our meetings, but it's carpeted, has things like a TV in there or something for the students to utilize a little bit more or turn it into a different area entirely, maybe into something like a small gym. I was also wondering, do we need all the parking that we have at Bedford? Like lot G is massive, um, but if we got rid of it, could we put a gym there for students to play sports in, to have intramural leagues, to have gym memberships for community members, things like that. And the last question is just broad. I know it's a lot, I apologize. Are we gonna be updating the bathrooms in any way, shape or form? Um, right now our bathrooms are pretty old school, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. But there are some um, interesting studies and information on unisex bathrooms, like getting rid of the male, female, making the doors go all the way to the bottom as opposed to just somewhat to the bottom. So you can see people's legs under there, having vacant versus um, in use um, levers, things of that nature. I'm just wondering if we're looking at the little things. Thanks. All right, uh, those are great, great, great topics. So first, let's let's tackle the first one about um, when we were about to build a new uh, life sciences building in Bedford. We were very focused on creating a building that on the first floor had a common space, like where we could have meetings. Because technically, in Bedford, as you've seen for professional day, that is the only large space that we have 
that accommodates everyone. And from an expense factor, every time we use the Indian Conference Center, which we do not own, we must rent that for a professional day. So whenever we bring the entire campus together, um, I would say, other than the theater, which really wouldn't hold everybody anyway, and the Academic Arts Center, there is no physical space on campus other than that entire space where we could fit everybody in. So I'm not sure that that's the answer of, of shifting things around, but I do get what you're saying. I'm gonna be really frank with you about the fact that it's underutilized is because there aren't a lot of students on the Bedford campus. Our schedule has dipped away from Bedford and we have very few classes. I think when you start seeing the utilization information that we have about classroom space and who's on Bedford, um, it has changed dramatically post pandemic and that we've got to address as well. The second piece, but I think we can talk about reconfiguring student space. In fact, reconfiguring the student lounge and a renovation there might make a lot of sense with some carpeting and some other kinds of things that you're talking about. Um, and, and there's a gym already on the Bedford campus, never highly underutilized by students. In fact, I wanna say that of the percentage, it was mostly staff that used it. It's staff that asks us about it all the time because it was a great amenity for staff. In fact, our lawyers that are over in the farmhouse would love to bike in, take a shower and go over and do their work. But along with that, there's a responsibility and issues around insurance and making sure that we have staffing for that gym. So it comes with its own. Now, the interesting thing that you're mentioning is, yeah, we have a lot of parking spaces. So could there be a public-private partnership uh, in terms of uh, a gym location on the on the Bedford campus? You know, never say never. You, you don't know exactly how that would play out. I don't, I don't know if Planet Fitness wants to come down and turn South Academic into, uh, you know, into a gym. I don't know. I mean, I think what well, we have to approach this with really open minds about anything, anything is possible, right? But everything's going to come with a price tag. That's the other thing that we have to remain. And so, and we're on a, a schedule in the state where only every couple of years can we really talk about a major capital project. So it's, can the institution afford to do it themselves? Is it something we can accomplish with, you know, some fundraising, which we've attempted to be very aggressive about, um, and then the other piece is that to what degree can we use our deferred maintenance monies in the best, most uh, affordable way to make change. But yeah, some of those parking lots, and, and we don't need them anymore. Uh, and I doubt there'll ever be a time that we will need them for parking again. Uh, we were, many of us remember the days when students used to hike out from those parking lots and take a shuttle in or walk in uh, because we had shuttles that would take them from those far flung parking lots in uh, those days of those numbers are pretty much gone at this point based on where we are with our current enrollment and what we see for the future. So yes, those spaces, those parking lot spaces, in fact, are going to be important to whatever development we may do on the Bedford campus. I don't know if I caught it all, Ed, I think I did. I think there were three things, but we think we caught oh, them. Just the last one. Um, are we going to be looking at the bathrooms at all in terms of how they're laid out or what updates we could do to them? Yeah, and in fact, whenever we've renovated any spaces, that's been part of the conversation, uh, was part of the conversation here. Um, when What Ellen will tell you, anybody who's done any uh, facilities planning knows that the most expensive part of any building is the bathrooms, right? And so it is certainly, and we've had lots of conversations here about gender neutral bathrooms and identifying where they are, but it's important for us to go back in and take a look at that. Um, even when we did renovations to the Cowan building, um, we, for the amount of money that we had to do those renovations, we did not have enough money to do the bathrooms on every floor. I mean, and that's my big regret for what we weren't able to do on the first, second, and third floor of Cowan when we made significant renovations here is those bathrooms and the expense there was, um, was significant. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, another direct message came through. Um, I think this is just a comment. Um, with regards to spaces for students and the overall planning for future building usage, there is great potential in spaces that offer both opportunity for the study of the environment, agricultural and horticultural curriculum, and adjacent slash adjoining areas for social gathering. Absolutely true. So for those folks who want to create that curriculum, come on down. That's what I think of that solar panels and the opportunity to use some of the outside space, the space in the wetlands, the trail that we have there, um, how do we capitalize on that beautiful, Bedford is a beautiful facility. Uh, and I think that it is an asset for us, most assuredly, 
you know, I'm I'm sure that anybody would say, and I, we might even hear this when we hear some recommendations. Uh, it would not be too far flung to think that everything that we currently operate could operate on one campus. Uh, I'm saying that that might be something that is said by consultants. Uh, we know that the Bedford campus is too important to us, to the history of the institution and to who we are. And the fact that we have both an urban and a suburban campus is really um, is really special. It's part of what makes it, the institution unique. And we want to lean into that uniqueness. So the opportunity to grow environmental programs on the Bedford campus, bring it on. Happy, happy to have it. Lisa. Yes. <laughs> I'm working on that. Like I said, advertise the ecology class. We will get them outside. We will study the ponds. We'll study the streams. We'll get out there. And like I mentioned in the comment, we will calculate the carbon dioxide captured by those trees in our campus as well. Um, we're really engaged with the community garden, trying to expand that, you know, access, get more people involved. It's open to anybody in terms of the sustainability club. And then um, I love to get students outside there and hike. But I have to say, even we, there's a lot of really cool opportunities for environmental studies in Lowell as well. So um, I teach environmental science in Lowell and we're doing all kinds of great stuff in, in Lowell. So we don't forget urban ecology is also super important. Here, here, beautifully said. Thank you. Uh, let's see here, uh, back on the bathroom um, topic. It would be great to see free tampon and pad dispensers in all of the bathrooms. And uh, could we just do thorough cleanings that would in the bathrooms that would be a great improvement? Yep, Bo both of those points are well taken. And in fact, I'm not exactly sure. I don't visit the women's bathroom all that often. Uh, so I don't know, but that I did not even know that those dispensers had been taken down. Maybe somebody can we can do a little research on that, Patrick, about where that has happened and how we might be able to place. I know that uh, sort of uh, that dispension of essential needs has, uh, is available through our our food pantry. is not just a food pantry. It's certainly been expanded over time, uh, but, but having them in the bathrooms would make great sense. So I think we have to take a look at that as well. All right, I do not see any other chats. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, we still have some time left, so if you have anything else you would like to ask of our experts, please do so now. On the next level of what we'll be sharing with you will be some of the other information from the 90 page, the, the larger presentation. I know Marianne had to run to another meeting, but I uh, really appreciate uh, the folks that have been with us today from, from DCAM and from Sasaki. Uh, Sadeshna, thank you for being with us. Ellen, thank you as always. We really appreciate the feedback, the small and the large. Um, but I think that Sasaki, when they finish all of their recommendations, they're going to be, I've asked them to be as bold as they possibly can. So I'm not trying to shock you all. I'm just telling you that we currently have two campuses that are underutilized, right? In terms of classroom space. And that has happened post pandemic. We have to have a solution. We do not need all of the buildings that we currently have. And that means that we're going to have to re-examine how we use space, and that's every space. So as I've joked with people who have moved into new offices, et cetera, I've said, don't anybody get too comfortable anywhere because we're gonna have to really look across the institution, how we efficiently use space and what we can do to some of these buildings. And in Bedford, for sure, we're going to have to talk about, I don't want anyone to be shocked by this either, taking down a couple of old buildings that the deferred maintenance does not make sense for us to continue to have those buildings. And we really want to focus away from the quad, right? Keeping the quad as together as it possibly could. And perhaps how do we look at uh, renovating even someplace like Henderson Hall to be able to create more STEM opportunities, more, more efficient and updated labs, more hands-on stuff. So this could be a great puzzle across the board about where things belong. And I will say to all the chairs and coordinators and all the faculty, this is a good time in division meetings to have conversations about, you know, where 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 does your program really belong? You know, where where would you be able to capitalize both on space and on students? And I, I don't want us to forget 
that we have two campuses that imparted the culture of this institution. And as long as I'm here, we're still gonna have two campuses. We've got a shuttle system that takes students back and forth. So how do we figure out how does that, how does that schedule work for students as well? So this is going to be a big conversation. Sasaki is gonna give us some recommendations. We'll share those with you, but I think there's gonna be a, a broad spectrum of what those recommendations can and should be and how we best use our assets. And so please use the ideas and, 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 and make sure that they keep coming. The MCC master plan email that's up there for you, do not hesitate to use it. Please keep sending things into us. Uh, and we'll be talking about sort of additional renovations and projects going forward. But I do want to thank our presenter today, and I want to thank all of you for your time. Lisa, your hand is still up. Did, we, did you have something else you wanted to? One quick question. There used to be a dashboard that showed us how much energy was, stay, uh, was saved with our ground source heat pump. And I clicked on it, and there's no data. Has that been turned off? I'm just curious how to get the most current data on for that. Uh, Is that the trustees house you're talking about, Lisa? Yeah. Um, yep. I'll check with Frank Morandi from Bedford to see what the status of that dashboard is. But um, that's only okay. the, that's, that's, we had the geothermal that we got from an airmark a number of years back. Yeah, because yeah. I found the link and, you know, the, the historical data are show, still showed, but the current data, it's like zero. I'm like, well, I know it's still working. Yeah, no, hey, thanks for letting us know that. I had no idea. So Okay, thank you. You're probably thank one you. of the few people that looks at that on a regular <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Uh, one more question, um, Phil, uh, that was uh, sent to me. Uh, I heard earlier there will be new biotech spaces in Henderson Hall. Currently, most, if not all, biotech classes are in the Lowell Talbot building. Do we know what classes will move? Oh, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, the conversation has been with the dean of the area and the faculty of the area of expanding the, the biotech programs, uh, especially at a need of the state is at, at, at is talking about 70,000 new jobs that are going to be available over the next few years. So we're not producing biotechnicians fast enough, uh, even though we have just an exceptional signature program in biotech. So this is about expanding that program. It's not an either or. And the department is really discussing different forms of uh, the program and what will be here. So none of that will be decided without a discussion with the program. We're talking about some laboratories that uh, would be multi multi use as well in terms of that renovation. Um, that's not going to happen tomorrow. We've gotten some money from Mass Life Sciences. We've gotten some private money that I'm out trying to raise. We've gotten earmarks from one of our Congress people, but but that is a ways in coming. Uh, it's going to take us a while to raise all the money that we need. And as I can tell you, with any physical plant uh, plan now, uh, if if something starts at four million. I can tell you by the time it gets built, it's more like 7 million. So it, it is a very complicated time to be able to answer how fast something is going to be renovated and what we will need to accomplish that. So the most important part is to really look at an opportunity to expand high demand programs so that we become part of the workforce solution in the state of Massachusetts. And we're gonna to continue to do that. On top of that, we're gonna to continue to do everything we do around liberal arts and transfer because we know that's an incredibly viable option for our institution as well. So that idea about discussion about programs, it's not necessarily an either or, it may be an and. Uh, Maria or Yvette, I don't know if either one of you wants to weigh in because I know we've had this conversation about the microscopy and some of the, the different offerings that you would provide down in Bedford versus what you've currently got in, in Lowell. Where'd you go? Yes, I could just say that uh, we plan on uh, building a state-of-the-art genetics lab, and the second lab would be a bioinformatics lab, though they the labs will be general enough that you can put various classes in them. Also, we'll have a microscopy room, so there's a wide variety of microscopes, so it's it, it covers many, many areas of biotech and biology. Perfect. Thanks, Ivetta. Yep, it's it's about expansion. It isn't necessarily in an area that is fast growing uh, with high demand. And that is it. I do not see anything else in the chat, Phil. Folks, I just want to thank you again for your time. As always, your feedback has been invaluable. 
Uh, thank, we've recorded this. I know that our, our partners in Sasaki and, and at DCAM really appreciate hearing from the whole campus as I do. As we get more information, we'll send that information out to you as the plan uh, progresses. Uh, I also want to ask all of you to take an opportunity. I know you've been doing a great job of filling out 360 evaluations for folks on my leadership team, as I've been asking folks to do and that we promised would happen over the course of this time. Uh, it's time for another presidential evaluation. So hopefully you will have seen that come out as, as Joanna rings her hands, right? She can't wait. She's going to go fill it out now. Uh, as uh, you would take the time to really complete that. We've shortened that evaluation for this year because last year's was long and torturous. So it's a little, little shorter this time around. So I appreciate you uh, taking the time to fill that out, that those results will go to the Board of Trustees. I think it closes around the 24th, but uh, I think it just went out today from HR. So we'll be sending you uh, reminders to be able to do that as well. Your, your feedback and your input around uh, how we're running the institution is really important to all of us. So thank you. And again, thank you all again for your time for an incredibly valuable conversation. And Ellen, thank you so much for being with us and to our Sasaki partners, whoever's left that I cannot see. Thank you so much for your presentation. More information to come, folks. Thanks and have a great afternoon.